Hello and welcome to Story Communications with DJ Finley. I am, of course, your hostess, a DJ Finley. And today I want to talk about an article that was brought to my attention. And the article is called Why Your Daughter and You Should Watch the New Mulan. And that was kind of like, what? When I first heard about it, because <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the Disney Mulan, but I'm willing to put aside or try to put aside my prejudice towards the movie to kind of talk about this article because the guy who wrote this article, his name is Leonard Sachs. And don't worry, all the articles I talk about in this podcast, the link will be in the description box below. So I'll I'll make sure to link all articles in the description box below. I encourage you to go and read them yourself. And if you have any thoughts that you think I missed or I misunderstood or you have your own take on it, feel free to email me about what you thought or what you gathered from your reading of the articles. So I would love to hear your, your opinions or your takes on this. All right, so Dr. Sachs's argument in his article, his thesis statement is, what happens to a girl whose talents and passions lie in a domain traditionally reserved to boys and men? Which is actually a very interesting and good thesis for an article. It's not a bad uh, topic to touch on or discuss, but there are a couple of things that there's a couple of things in the article that Dr. Sachs contradicts himself on. So he first goes on to say that Mulan is worth watching because it is a great movie with a compelling plot and it teaches an important truth. A girl does not have to pretend to be a man in order to excel in a traditionally male domain. All right, that is a good topic to talk about. That is a very relevant and interesting topic to talk about because he was talking about how how in today's culture, especially modern society as it is right now, girls who want to do boyish things are often asked if they are trans, if they have preferred pronouns, you know, are they trying to present themselves as a, as a boy, or are they trying to become non-binary? Basically, trans activism has had an ironic effect on reinforcing gender stereotypes, he says. Girls who want to fight in combat are now asked if they are really boys, and boys who want to study ballet are asked if they are really girls. This is a problem that has mainly come up because people can't decide if I... Uh, well, people can't fully go with an argument that goes with what they they want. Because a lot of people, they either want to go with, there is no difference between the genders, but if there's no difference between the genders, then where exactly do trans people fit in? And, which is a very... You know, that's, that's a good argument. Where do trans people fit in? And uh, how do they coincide with the rest of society? However, my one problem with this article is that he completely throws the Disney cartoon, the, the Mulan cartoon from 1998, under the bus, saying that it is a children's movie and that the, that the remake, the live action, is a more serious look at to his question of of girls happen to pretend to be men in order to survive in men-dominated fields. Surprisingly, the cartoon actually did address that. That is basically the whole ending climax of the cartoon is that exact same question. And he doesn't do a compare and contrast. He just talks about the the remake and, and he praises it without contrasting it alongside his predecessor. Dr. Dr. Sachs in his article says, the first half of the movie, Mulan takes the road that might be prescribed by a woke 21st century counselor. She adopts the male role, taking a man's name and dressing and fighting as a man. But in one of the movie's most powerful sequences, midway through the movie, the witch, Shan Nen, challenges her and calls her a liar. Your deceit weakens you, Shan Nen says. It poisons your chi. The narrator then... Uh, tells us that a lie can only live so long. Mulan throws off the trappings of a male uh, role and see she had adopted. Her helmet falls to the ground, she pulls off her father's armor, and she fights much better without it. The aerial pirouettes to disarm and kill her opponents. A scene which reminded me of David deci David's decision not to wear the armor when fighting Goliath. Okay, so a couple of things here. Yeah, she throws off the whole being a man thing, but... Uh, he completely neglects to point out that in the movie, after doing this scene, the scene is like very straightforward. You disguising yourself as a dude is poisoning you as a woman. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's that's a problem that a lot of girls face. But he neglects to point out how it affects the rest, how it affects the story in a narrative form. And 
this is where his argument kind of falls apart, because later in the article, he references uh, Mark, I'm going to butcher your last name, Bjor- Borlin, 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 Mark Bowerling article, Beauty and Char- Charismatic Humanities, because in, later in the article, he talks about the boycott, Dr. Sachs talks about the boycott of Mulan due to it being filmed near Chinese concentration camps of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. And he talks about how we should separate politics from movies because he says that um, we must hold firmly to the separation of aesthetics from politics. Well, I read The Beauty and Charismatic Humanities by Mark Borlin, Borlin, Borlin? I'm so sorry, I'm going to, I'm just butchering your name. Uh, and his argument is that we should leave all politics out of uh, literature and the arts. In his, it's, in order to win the undergraduates once more, the humanities have to have a clear course to follow. They must abandon identity politics, which only produce a tense and humorless classroom. More deeply, they must insist upon the old appeals to genius, greatness, masterpiece, beauty, and sublimity, which is a complete contradiction to Sachs's argument of this movie being a message to young girls telling them that they don't need to dress up as a man or become a man or transition as to being a man in order to survive a male-dominated field. Because if you read Mark Borlin, Borlin, I just call him Mark. I am so sorry. I cannot pronounce your last name. I am so, so sorry. In his article, he talks about how constantly trying to put in religious or political or science meaning into a work of art, you basically overshadow it with a bunch of things that the art is not actually doing. You need to pull that stuff away from the art and enjoy it as its own entity, away from everything else. In the article by Mark, uh, he talks about how, let's see, where is it? Mark says, quote, they should not let the moral righteousness of political correctness intimidate intimidate them. Back in the 70s, a political, see, the political ones had a certain authority of anti-discrimination on their side. The civil rights movement, women's liberation, and gay liberation were, were still fresh and energetic, giving political professors an edge over the traditionalists. The latter rated Ezra Pound, one of the talents of the 20th century, the former repelled. You really want to make students read um, that anti-Semitic swine. Yes, they should have said. We sure do. But the diagnosis um, of moral advancement was too strong for the traditionalists to hold firmly to the separation of aesthetic from politics. The way that Dr. Sachs used Mark's article of the beauty of charismatic humanities is he was using it to defend his argument as to why you shouldn't boycott Mulan over the human rights violations of the concentration camps abusing and degrading Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang province, which is not entirely what the article is talking about. Yes, the article of beauties and charismatic humanities does touch on leaving out modern-day politics when looking at a piece of art, but that isn't entirely what the article is talking about. It is talking about leaving politics of any kind, adding in anything to a piece, is what the article is saying don't do. That is adding, taking, taking something and adding to it. Kind of like when, oh, this happens so much in church, kind of like when People are looking at a, at a movie or a Bible story in church, and they sit there and nitpick it and talk about this means this, or this symbolizes this, or this is talking about this. When you sit there and nitpick at a story and add what you think it is talking about, you are adding to the work and not appreciating the work as what it is by itself as a whole. Mark says in, in his article, Quote, things have changed, though, not with hiring, but with the popularity of the majors. We are at the point where the anti-discrimination movement is tired and repetitive. Oh, yes, the woke revolution is urgent and ruthless, but that's because it's out of 
intellectual gas. The catchwords and slogans you hear in the movement were already cliches back in 2000. There is nothing intellectually deep or aesthetically clever about wokeness, and it suffers badly when compared to humanity's theories of old. Hegel's in- interpretation of tragedy is an ingenious explanation of that brand of human suffer- of human suffering. Intersectionality is a pedestrian enumeration of identity factors and dose of, of resentment to giving it stridency. Hegel will last. Intersectionality won't. I think many young people sense this. Students are ready for charismatic humanities that for- foregoes the mission of progressive politics. They want to enjoy Fl- Flannery O'Connor, not put her on the dock. They don't need their humanities, humanities teachers to repeat what they get from Kevin's Life events, celebrities on Twitter, and advertising from Nike and The Gap. Okay. So, why am I making a big deal about this? What I'm making a big deal about with this article is, while I do agree with Dr. Sachs to a certain extent, I do agree with him on the side of the whole over-stereotyping and, uh, how did he put it? The hardening of gender stereotypes, as Dr. Sachs put it, in regards to the transgender uh, activism, is, yes, it is hurting a lot of women and making them think that they need to dress up as men to survive in a man-dominated profession, which is wrong. That is completely wrong, and I do agree with Sachs on his point on that is wrong, and that a story like this of a girl showing that she can survive in a man-dominated field as a woman is a good story and is an important story to tell. I do agree with him on that, and I think he completely has a point there. My problem comes in with story communications. That is where my problem comes in, because in focusing on that, he's completely disregarded his argument that he tried to back up with beauty and charismatic humanities, because Mark is actually more on point than Dr. Sachs, because he's talking about leaving, the story must be able to stand on its own merit, stand as its own identity, as its own thing, aesthetically working as a story. While in saying that, the Mulan 2020 film is built on identity politics, it is built on girl power, it is built on sending a message, a feminist message, out into the world. And that is where the story falls apart, because it is built on that politics, on that identity politics. You take out that politics and you look at the story as what it is by itself, as its own entity, it instantly falls apart. And if you're thinking that I'm just going off on it because I don't like Disney remakes, which is true, I do not like Disney remakes, let me do a step-by-step comparison between the, the cartoon Mulan from 98 and the 2000 Mulan. All right, so in the cartoon, if Mulan shows people that she is a woman, she will be put to death. She is not in the war to prove that as a woman, I I can fight just as well and effectively as a man. I can survive in this male-dominated field. That's not why she went to war. She went to war to save her family and her country, most importantly her father. But she's she's saving she's saving other people. She she's putting other people's wants and desires before her, and the penalty of doing so is death. If she is discovered, the penalty is death. And so let's contrast the endings. Let's contrast the reveal of Mulan as a woman. So in the cartoon, she completely uh, disguises herself as a as a man until she is injured in the fight against the Huns in the mountains, where all the in the snowy mountains. She gets injured and she has to be tended to, which in doing so reveals that she is a girl because they're not gonna miss what's in the upper chest region because she's revealed to be a girl. She has to tell everyone who she is, and. Everybody has to make a choice, basically. Milan knows that she has to accept her fate, the fate that she knew she was going to have to accept if this came out, and she does. She knows she's going to get. She's, she knows she's going to die. She doesn't plead for her life. She doesn't. I believe she tells them that she did it to save her father, though. Yeah, I think she tells them I did it to save my father. And the one dude whose name I can never remember, but bloodthirsty dude. All uh, right, he tells Shane he needs to kill her, and Shane goes to kill her, but her three companions, Yao, Shenpo, and Ling, they first get up, they want they want to defend her, but the bloodthirsty guy, what is his name? I don't even know his name. 
she tells them, you know the law, and they have to stand down. Shane does not kill Mulan because she saved his life in the previous scene. And so he does kind of the a life for a life. He completely writes off the whole, okay, we're supposed to kill you, but you saved me. You were a good soldier, so I'm going to spare you. That's the decision he makes. Then Mulan comes to the realization, and you have this really sweet, tender scene of everybody being like, yeah, we're all just lies. We're all just lies, and look where it got us. It completely, it completely backfired on who we are. And so you have this really sweet, tender scene between her and Mushu talking about what lies they are and uh, how this didn't work out. And then she sees the Huns are still alive, and she goes to the Imperial City to warn Shang and the others that the Huns are still alive, and they completely disregard her. Shane tells Mulan to go home, and Mulan tells him, you would listen to Ping. Why is Mulan any different? That is a way more powerful line, talking about girls in a male-dominated field, than your deceit weakens you, it poisons your chi. That is a way more powerful line, because Mulan is actually making a point to a man in a man's field you would be okay accepting information from me as another man, but as a woman, as who I am right here and now, you, you're you disregarding me. You're, you're throwing me to the wayside. Just because of my gender, you are throwing me to the wayside. That is way more powerful than your deceit poisons your chi. I'm like, what? Anyway, so no one believes Mulan. Mulan goes, she runs around the crowd, but no one wants to listen to her because she is a, a woman. She's, she's still a woman. And even Mushu points that out, hey, you're a girl now. No one's going to listen to you. And then the Huns show up and they kidnap the emperor. And Shane tries to break the door down, but that doesn't work. But an interesting thing is when Mulan tells the guys that she has an idea, the, her three friends instantly abandon Shane and go with Mulan. They're like, you know what? Your ideas have not been working out too hot. She's had a lot of great ideas. She's been doing, a, she's been pulling her weight. She's been proving she can do a great job in this field. We're going to go listen to her. See ya, Shane. And so they ditch Shane and yeah, they cross dress, but you know, they, they ditch Shane and they go with what Mulan uh, suggests and they listen to her as their equal. They, they do what Mulan says as their equal. Okay, and I think you all basically know the ending by that point, and then, you know, and everyone points out how much in trouble she is because she's a girl. And also, the guys, uh, when the one dude shows up, the guys get in front of Mulan to protect her from Mr. Bloodthirsty. I can't remember his name. I can't believe I can't remember his name. Mr. Bloodthirsty, who's like, she's a woman. She's not worth protecting. And they're like, are you insane? She is totally worth protecting. And then the emperor, you know, he kind of tells her, and then the emperor, he tells her that, you know, you disregarded all these things in our culture. You uh, dressed up as a boy. You ran away from home. You destroyed my palace and you have saved us all. And he lets her go home with honors. And, you know, it's a sweet uh, ending. Okay, so the live action one. And I'm, I'm going to finish comparing these two. And then I'll talk. To, I'll explain how they don't work story communication wise. In the other one. Mulan rides off away from her group because I think she's following something. It's not super clear. And then the witch shows up and they have their little fight one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of them. I think this is the part the guy's talking about. Yeah, this is the part. And the witch tells her that, I think this is the part that Dr. Sachs is talking about. This is the part where the witch tells her that your deceit poisons your chi. And you basically have these this, this woman being like, you know, you're going to die a lie. And so she tries to kill her. But it's the corset thing that's... This one thing I thought was interesting because people forget that actions are... What, what, what your characters do physically, what happens to your characters physically is also part of the story. And the witch throws a star, one of those little throwy stars at Mulan and it hits her in the armor. It breaks her armor. It breaks her male armor, but it is stopped the, the leather thing that is hiding her, her lady parts. It's stopped by the thing hiding her lady parts. And I'm like, wait, that thing broke through your armor, but if it hadn't been stopped by the thing hiding the fact that you're a woman, you would be dead. So what exactly is the imagery on that? And then she throws away her armor, probably because it's useless, because the witch can totally just disintegrate it. Uh, so she throws away her armor, and she starts, like, doing all kinds of crazy stuff in the 
army. And then the witch shows up as a bunch of birds and terrorizes the soldiers. They're scared of birds. Okay. So she terrorizes the soldiers and she makes them turn into little um, groupings so that the bad guys who have a trebuchet... <laughs> Why there's a trebuchet on a battlefield with no castle around is beyond me, but okay. These guys have a trebuchet and they start taking out large groups of the of the soldiers because they're all bunched up together and not moving. All right. Mulan grabs some helmets. She sneaks to behind the bad guy lines and she gets their attention and she annoys them enough and she makes them think there's a bunch of soldiers behind them that they turn... I think there's only one... Yeah, there's one trebuchet. They turn their one and only trebuchet around and they hit the mountain with a flaming ball of fire. They've hit the mountain, they hit a glacier, and cause an avalanche. And that's the avalanche scene from from Mulan. And they do the whole avalanche thing. I will get to this, why that's stupid in a moment. And then she goes to her commanding officer. She's now a woman. It's not very plain she's a woman. She's not wearing armor or anything to hide the fact she's a girl. And her superior officer is asked what, what should be her punishment. And he says that she's going to be banished from the group. She's Go away. And Mulan says, I would rather be executed. <laughs> and the the guy says, we'll execute you if you come back. And I'm just like, well, then turn around and come back and, you know, then you'll be executed, but whatever. And so he tells her to, to leave. So she has to leave. And then you see her in the desert, how she goes from snow to desert. That's like a, she goes a long time before she turns out crying. She starts crying. So she starts crying in the desert. And the witch shows up and tells Mulan that they are not so different. She gives her the the most cliche villain speech <laughs> in recorded history of the we are the same, you and I. We are we are exactly the same. We are two very similar people. <laughs> okay. And uh, she also tells Mulan the bad guy's plans and how the bad dude is going to destroy their monarchy and is going to take over their country and Mulan is like you are wrong I am nothing like you I'm going I I fight for honor and all those other good things and my country I love my country the country that if I go back will kill me and so Mulan goes back and she tells the 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 general and her friends hey the bad guys are going to come and her general says no I don't believe you you came back, we got to execute you. And her friends go, I believe her, I believe her, I believe her. To the point that the general's like, okay, fine. All your friends believe you. You're these lower officers. All these lower officers believe you. So I guess I got to spare you. And guess what? We're going to have you lead us to the Imperial City. So Mulan gets to lead the charge to the Imperial City where they have this crazy drawn out fight, which by the way, the bad guys don't kill the emperor when they totally could kill the emperor. And you have this crazy fight between Mulan and the bad guys, and then she runs into the witch. Well, the bad, the, the, the emperor gets caught in the most stupid trap ever, and uh, Mulan uh, finds out where he is by following... Well, she goes to the, the throne room, and she runs into the witch, and the witch is like, we're totally going to win. And Mulan is like, I'm going to follow you, you know, the witch is in bird form, and it would be really hard to follow. It's really hard to follow um, Hawks by the way. So um, Mulan follows the witch to where the emperor is being held. The bad guy shoots an arrow to kill Mulan and the witch is like, oh dang, you be evil. And so the witch turns into a hawk and blocks the arrow so that it doesn't kill Mulan and the witch dies. Yay! Because she became good. So she's now dead. And because that's what happens if you're evil and you become good, you, you instantly die. So Mulan goes and she fights the bad guy one-on-one she loses her sword and it's kind of like this oh crap all hope is lost moment but then you have the emperor say rise up like a phoenix and so she rises up and her stupid phoenix buddy shows up does some parrot wings behind her and she knocks the she uses the guy the, the guy cuts a rope and he falls he should have died from that fall but he doesn't die so shoots an arrow the emperor catches the arrow and then he throws the arrow, Mulan kicks the arrow, and kills the bad guy. And everybody's alive, the Emperor's like, 
Yay, cool for you. Uh, he offers her a place in his army. She says, no, I'm going to go home. She goes home and then the emperor shows up. Well, the emperor's men show up later and give her a sword and they tell her that the spot in the army is still open. How does that not work in communi- story communications? It doesn't work because it doesn't make sense. It's a bunch of scenes. It's it's an in the 2020 version, the the scenes in Mulan are complicated, confusing, and meandering, which is never a good thing to have in your story. Complicated, confusing, and meandering are the things that should be instantly thrown out of any good story. The 98 version of Mulan, the cartoon, it's very tight. And one thing a lot of people don't realize about uh, stories, well, especially communication in stories, is that communications has has an act and react method of storytelling. For every action, there is an equal and equivalent reaction. Writing a story is all about action and reaction. Every character makes an action and every character reacts to another character's reaction or a situation or whatever it is. Your, your characters are going through a dance of action and reaction. There are such things as a complete action character and a complete reaction character. These are characters who either they just go off and do everything or they just react to everything. No one likes a character who just acts or just reacts. Good storytelling is a mix. It's a nice even blend of characters acting and reacting to each other and what is going on around them, which is what the Disney Mulan does. And Dr. Sachs does not reference that. And he doesn't even reference that really awesome bad A line of you listen to Ping, why not me? Because, you know, and, and she knows why, because you're, she's a girl and it frustrates her because she's like, you know, I won over their trust. I won over their brothership. They're not listening to me. And that's very frustrating. Mulan in the 2020 version, she walks up and shows them, I'm a chick, because she's like, you know what, this is poisoning my chi, and I better go and let everybody know I'm a chick. And then she leaves, cries, and then has to get a you and I are not so different talk from the witch, and then find out that the bad guys are going to attack the main city. And then she goes and does something. She doesn't do something because she she realizes, oh, I need to go and warn my friends that the Huns are attacking the Imperial City. She does it because she's like, I'm not like you. I'm not like you and I'm going to prove I'm not like you. So Dr. Sachs is basically trying to say that the Mulan remake is... See, how did he put it? He put that it is... It's an imaginative exploration of the question. He's he's talking about how you should watch the Mulan remake because it it brings up very, very blatantly, it brings up the question, his thesis statement of the article, which is what happens to a girl whose talents and passions lie in a domain traditionally reserved to boys and men, which is a good topic. It is a good uh, thing to tell a story on. The problem falls into the fact that Mulan 2020 relies 100% on that. Mulan 2020, once you take that theme out and you just look at it as its own piece of art, as the writer of Beauty and Charismatic Humanities tells you to do, the movie as a whole falls apart. It doesn't hold as a cohesive work of fiction. The, The characters as themselves don't have any standing by themselves. They don't carry the story by themselves. The entire story is carried on this narrative. And when the story only is carried on a narrative, the moment you take that narrative out to look at it, to look at it from a non-political view, because the narrative is political. So if you want to take out a non-political, if you want to look at it non-politically, you have to take out the politics. And if the narrative is politics, then you basically dropped it. But it's not even really tied into who, who Mulan is as a person. She's just, she's an overpowered Mary Sue, who gets everything right. She doesn't do anything wrong. She doesn't mess up. She doesn't learn anything except for tell the truth. That's literally all she learns. But she's in a situation where telling the truth is not exactly a great idea. But because she's a Mary Sue, it it, it turns out to be a great idea. Also, Dr. Sachs completely destroys his argument when he talks about how great art enables us, trashy art degrades us. The kind of stories your children hears, the kind of art your children experiences, the influences, the kind of person she or he will become. A child who is reared on stories of strong, see, of so- and songs celebrating instant gratification of desire will grow up to be a different person from a child who is reared on stories and songs celebrating heroic 
um, self-sacrifice. Yeah, uh, Mulan 2020 is instant gratification. I'm sorry, but it is. I, and that whole thing I described to you, Mulan gets instant gratification. You know, yeah, they tell her, go away, goodbye. But she goes right back, and the moment she goes right back, everyone's like, well, her friends at least, are like, yeah, we totally believe Mulan, let's let's go with her. All right, cool. They believe you, so you will lead us into, our, into the fight. That's instant gratification. She showed up, everyone believes her, let's go, let's fight, nothing else. In the Mulan cartoon, no one believes her. No one listens to her. No one. Shane, her friends... The random people, like, no one in the city who is watching this parade listens to her. You know, it's not until the the Huns show up that everyone's like, oh, snap, she'd be right. Maybe we should listen to her. Maybe we should uh, listen to what she has to say. Listen to her plans. It's not until the Huns are there that people are like, oh, snap, we're, um, if we don't listen to her, we dead. Mulan, these guys have no shred of evidence, no proof that Mulan is telling the truth. You know, for all they know, she's just coming back and being like, hey, uh, please let me back in. <laughs> for all they know. They don't know that she is telling the truth. They don't know that she is warning them of the bad guys coming. And they just, but they just accept it anyway. You know, she has no way to prove it. That's kind of instant grat- gratification. That's like what a lot of people think, you know, just because I said it, you should believe me. No, just because you say something does not mean somebody has to believe you. I'm sorry. The cartoon actually addresses that. That's why it has that, that really awesome line that, you know, you would believe me if I was a dude, but because I'm not a dude, you don't believe me. That's not very fair. While in the remake, it's all about you. It's all about Mulan. It's all about, you know, your chi. Are you bad A enough? Are you cool enough? You, you know, you're a woman as male dominated feel, but you go, girl. You go and defeat him as a girl. You go and you go by yourself and you go and defeat him. Does he forget that in the Mulan cartoon, she defeated him in a dress with a fan? She defeated him in a very feminine way. You know, I'm just, just saying that they, they go, he goes on this whole talk about how, you know, a girl has to act like a dude. Mulan never really acted like a dude. She, she solved all of her problems mentally. She didn't solve her problems by punching someone. She solved her problems by looking at the situation and being like, okay. And I get that he's talking about how, like, a girl has to, uh, he's, I think he's frustrated over the fact that a lot of movies, the girl has to disguise that she's a girl and be, become a man in order to survive in a male-dominated field. I think that's what he's going after in his argument, but the cartoon did address it because he, he's sitting there talking about how, you know, great art ennobles us and trashy art degrades us. I don't think that Dr. Sachs has experienced a lot of really good art that actually tackles this problem. When I was reading through his article, I kept thinking of the TV show Remington Steel, or the episode The Ugly Duckling from MacGyver, or the movie Sphinx, or Princess Leia from Star Wars, or The Great Race, and the women's suffragettes in that movie, or um, the movie Feds and the women becoming FBI agents, or The Intern and a woman in a writing her own business in a male-dominated field, or all the women in Murder, She Wrote. You know, these are those are stories that talk about women in a male-dominated field as women. And also, all those are really good. All those are very good stories, very well structured. The narrative of a woman surviving in a man's domain is very present in the characters of who these women are and the choices that they make. It is not present in Mulan. She is just doing it because the script demands it, which is why when you take the politics out of Mulan 2020, the entire movie falls apart. In uh, Beauty and Charismatic Humanities, Mark quotes a man named Kant who says it is only when the want is appeased that we can distinguish which of the many men has or has not taste. And what he's talking about is in his explanation is that a thirsty man can't tell the difference between a really good expensive bottle of wine and a Trader Joe's bottle of wine because they're both thirsty. They both want something to drink. But after they've had the wine, that they can finally be like, oh, this is either, their their thirst has been clenched. And so they can either say, yes, this is either a very good wine or a very bad wine. I think the reason he, uh, Dr. Sachs sees Mulan as a great movie is because Dr. Sachs himself, like many other people who review and regard a lot of modern cinema as 
great masterpieces, and I'm saying that with air quotes, is because they've never experienced or looked back on the actual great masterpieces that did break the glass ceiling long before the 2000s that did actually ask tough questions. Actually, I think The Intern came out in 2015. So that one is actually a good movie that was that's recent. But because people don't pay homage to the actual good films, to the actual good stories that are stories that stand on their own merit, the moment you take politics out of it, they still stand on their own merit. They still stand as good, aesthetically pleasing stories, even with the politics removed, even with the modern politics removed. They still stand well, while Mulan 2020 does not. And I think that's what one of the things that really hurts Dr. Sachs's argument in his uh, article is because he's trying to present, and I, and I think he really does see Mulan as this great work of fiction, which I'm really sorry for the kind of movies you watch if you see Mulan 2020 as a great work of fiction, because like I said, Remington Steele, the main character in that show, Laura Halt, she is like, she was so many women's icons. She was a well-dressed, very feminine woman who was a private investigator. That's a very manly field, but she was still a woman in that field. And so if you want a good role model for being a woman in a man-dominated film, watch Remington Steele, because that is literally a lot of the decisions that are made in the movie are affected by that. It's who Laura is as a person and what she wants. And it just works. It just works really well together up until season five. But it works really well together in the first several seasons when they really focus in on that. She wants credit for her work. She wants people to acknowledge that she has the brains and the skill to do the things and the work that she does. She wants recognition, and very understandably so. And so that's where, and that's one of the reasons why this article just sort of like kind of stood out to me. It was like, he's he's trying to make a good argument. I mean, he has a good a good thesis statement, but he's so focused on, please like this movie, that he completely pulls the rug out from under him. He doesn't compare Mulan 2020 to the original movie. He doesn't bring up the fact that there are a lot of films that do this and actually do it better. He even says that Mulan 2020 doesn't preach. I'm sorry, I watched the scene that you referenced, and that's a very preachy scene. Okay, let's, let's define preachy. Okay, preaching. The delivery of a sermon or religious address to an assembly group of people, typically in a church, giving of moral ev moral evidence in a pompously self-righteous way. Yeah, that scene, that scene that he was praising in his article is actually the definition of preachy. Because it's like, oh, you... You're disguising the fact that you're a woman in a man's world. You, it's damaging you. It's poisoning who you are. You should, you should take that off. Mulan doesn't make the choice herself. She makes the choice because another woman told her to do it. You know, she's reacting to the other woman who's like, hey, look at how awesome I am. I'm a woman and I accept this. And Mulan's like, well, I'm better than you because, you know, I'm still fighting for my country. And also, you know, I've, I actually killed your boss, which you totally could have done. But like the movie as, a, as itself, as a narrative, doesn't work. It doesn't hold up because no one does anything sensical. Like the part when Mulan uh, causes the avalanche. She sets up a bunch of helmets. She shoots a few of the bad guys with a bow and arrow. And they turn the trebuchet around to attack. That's a really stupid idea. The other soldiers, the rest of the army, are still huddled up in their cute little guardians. Send some men up to the back to take out who's ever firing arrows at you. Don't turn a trebuchet around to fire at a small group of men behind you. You are way too close in proximity to use a trebuchet anyways. It doesn't make any um, sense that way. It doesn't make any sense in regards to the way people respond to Mulan. It doesn't make sense in anyone's reactions to anything. People just react because the script said so. Oh, this is happening? We, we must respond this way because, well, it was in the script. You know, why doesn't the witch kill the bad guys and take over? You know, there's several scenes where the witch is in the throne room. Kill the emperor. I mean, that's the guy you want dead. Why Why are you guys taking so freaking long to kill the emperor? Why, why is it when people praise a movie of being a good movie for your daughters to watch, it's always a movie that makes no sense. Like, the characters make no sense. The decisions make no sense. What uh, the movie is 
portray, how the movie is portraying the the theme and what it's about doesn't make any sense. And yet every time there's a movie that, oh, well, it's okay because it's a girl empowering movie. So you're saying that a movie that narratively makes no sense, that doesn't make sense on a communications level, that doesn't make sense on a, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction level, on a character motivation level, on a, you know, any, any sensical level, it's okay because it has a good strong message for, for girls. While movies that do make sense, like Remington Steel, like the MacGyver episode, The Ugly Duckling, Sphinx, Star Wars, The Great Race, Feds, The Intern, Murder, She Wrote, shows that do make sense and still make this argument, and in a non-preachy way, in a logical way, characters bring it up in a good organic way, those don't get the recognition that they deserve. Why? Because they're outdated? I mean, The Intern's only from 2015. It's like five years ago. It's not that old. <laughs> you know, are, are, are these movies irrelevant because they are old? Well, if that's the case, if you're um, looking at them that way, well, then you are completely doing what uh, Mark Burlin, the guy wrote, who wrote Beauty and Charismatic Humanities, is telling you not to do. Because then you're adding politics to these movies. That this narrative of girls surviving in a man's world are actually part of who these characters are, who are as part of their decision-making, as part of the story and part of what is going on. You're completely throwing out this other writer's argument, which is an argument you use to back yourself up as to why Mulan shouldn't be boycotted for being made for a country that allows, for a government that allows uh, concentration camps. You know, I don't think he completely understood the article that he is, he is referencing. To, to back himself up. Basically, let me wrap this up. Dr. Sachs's argument about, you know, girls do need to recognize that they do not have to be boys to be in a boy-dominated field is a good argument. I am not throwing that argument out. But what I am saying is he doesn't, he doesn't uphold that argument by steering young girls towards movies that would actually help them. Because he even says, great art ennobles us, trashy art degrades us. The movies that are made today are made out of politics. They are made out of social identity. Whether, whether he wants to admit it or not, Mulan is made out of politics. It is made as a response to politics. The romance in there is made out of a response to politics. It's a very bad romance, very badly set up, very badly executed. The movie would have been stronger without a romance at all. Just have her bond with her guy friends. You know, girls can just be friends with guys. It's completely fine. I have a lot of guy friends I'm just friends with. But his argument about you need to separate... When, he's, when he references the one article, you need to sep separate art from politics. You can't do that with a film like Mulan. Mulan is built because of politics. The 2020 Mulan is built on politics. Shows like Remington Steel, yes, it is addressing the politics of the 80s when women were trying to break out of that social norm, but the women in Remington Steel are still just that. They are women. They have wants and desires and ambitions and goals that are still very feminine, which is one of the things he is talking about. You know, girls should not feel like they have to be boys to be in a male-dominated field. Mulan acts like a guy throughout the entire story. She wants to be a, a dude, pretty much. She, there's, there's nothing very exactly feminine about her. Uh, so she, she lets her hair down, I guess. But it's built on the narrative of uh, social politics. And it cannot be separated from that narrative. It does not hold together as a story. If you look at Mulan as a story, it doesn't hold together. It doesn't work. Characters don't make logical decisions. They don't have logical reactions. They don't have logical progression of thought. It's just, oh, the script told me to do so, so I shall do it because the script told me to do so. If you're going to sit there and talk about good art versus bad art, you need to expand your range of art, which is something I don't think Dr. Sachs has quite done. His argument is a valid argument, and it is a good argument, and it is an argument that should be discussed and brought to the forefront, but the way he's presenting his argument is not a, is not a good presentation of that argument, because there are so many better films for young girls to watch. There are so many better 
uh, lessons for them to consume. So many other people before Mulan 2020 have done a much better job, a much clearer representation of this problem, and it is just a shame to to see them put uh, put to the wayside and forgotten. I don't care if they're old. I don't care that the the films that do a better job are old. You know, that's that's the there's a reason we still watch Shakespeare. There's a reason we still enjoy Huckleberry Finn. There's a reason we still enjoy these old stories. Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, these great people wrote stories that last, that address issues, that talk about uh, things, and have good, compelling characters and storylines. Just because they're old doesn't mean they are invalid. Mulan 2020 will not age well. It will not survive the test of time. Mulan 98 will. So I hope you're able to get something out of it. Again, the links to the two articles are down in the description box below. So I highly recommend that you go and read them for yourselves. Get your own uh, ideas from them. That was just my I thought of them. But I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. I would love to get your feedback. You can always email me what you thought. You can either write it to, uh, to me in email or you can record it. If you record your... Um, thoughts and findings, I am more than happy to make another podcast and put your recordings in in there and respond to what you think. And I will talk to you guys later. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this content, make sure to follow on your favorite streaming platform. For all news and information about upcoming shows and what I'm up to, make sure to follow me on Facebook. If you wish to contact me to tell me either your thoughts on the episode you heard or or to give me suggestions on future podcasts, or maybe you'd like to co-host with me in a future podcast, you can either message me through Anchor, Facebook, or you can email me at Series of Lives Inc. All links are in the description box below. Make it a great day, and I will talk to you later. Bye!